what it is. Uh, good morning once again. My name is Glenn, a uh, pastor here at the Rock Church, one of the pastors. It's great to be with you this morning to bring God's Word. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, uh, and you should, I'm going to make that note, whether it's a Luddite version, a printed version. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, and you'd like one for this morning's uh, service or for one that you just would like to take home with you, we do have Bibles at the back uh, by the offering jar. You're more than welcome to um, and take that with you and uh, open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We will be in verses 4 to 11 today as uh, of our six-part series called the gifts of God for the whole church and today we're going to attempt to the best of my ability to conclude this to bring it together to more time in reading this morning pray that passage in my Luddite version my printed version even though I do have it here on my iPad uh, I want to be reading uh, the word of God for you and in front of you so let's read together Chapter 12, verses 4 to 11 in 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul wrote these words. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and every one. Each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the workings of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between, between spirits. And to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He wills. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, so good to be here this morning uh, together as, as, as a church family, to gather together, uh, to have fellowship with one another, to love one another, to be here and show up for one another, to sing praises to You, to hear Your Word, to have our children instructed in your word. Father, as we sang those songs this morning, I'm grateful for the fact that we are singing songs to you, Heavenly Father, to you, Lord Jesus Christ, and to you, Holy Spirit. You are one God in three persons. Each one equally God. And we acknowledge you. And we, we, this morning, we, we prayed in our singing you are welcome here holy spirit you are welcome here holy spirit today i ask you as we we look at these gifts holy spirit the one who empowers all of the gifts would you pour yourself out on us would you anoint these words these lips <laughs> and the preparation i've made in a special way today so that we might hear directly from you we pray these things together in jesus worthy name Amen. So as I was uh, praying uh, and preparing this week, it occurred to me once again, especially uh, because of doing this series, how, and as I prayed, you maybe would have picked that up, how clear it is to me that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how, how integral they are to the mission of every church and specifically, today, I'm speaking to us as a church. How involved each one of them is. Now, we know that our, our, our mission as a church is to make Jesus known. And, and it's about Jesus building his church. And, and so we highlight that, and we should. That's a good thing. But the reality is, and I hope you're going to see it today, is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are active in our church today. Every single one of them, completely. And incredibly necessary. And as I re reviewed these messages, actually the messages so far in the series, and con con considered today's text and how in the world you can wrap it up uh, after six weeks in one message that uh, doesn't frustrate you as I go on for an hour and a half, won't happen, I hope, uh, I, I realized that, oh, we could keep going. We could really keep going, couldn't we? 
It's rich. It's rich. There's so much here in these verses that we've looked at, but also in chapter 13 and chapter 14, which we've looked at periodically through this series. And so here's my prayer, my hope for you is, as I've been seeing in community group and small group, is that this conversation, this study will not end today. It will continue for weeks, for months, and over the next year. And, and as Matt highlighted, we have a Q&A page and, and we, we want you to ask questions. We want you to, to be searching the scriptures and asking the questions for yourself. What is my gift? What does that look like? What are my gifts? How do I know? Help. Ask. We would love to help you with that. So one thing that I feel is incredibly important, and I've been alluding to it a little bit this morning, that, that we see and conclude so far in this series to this point before we on today's the key reason why, and again, I, I say this, and some of you think I'm just kidding, but I'm not. Some of you know me really well. You know I'm not kidding when I say I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, okay? I, I have plans. We have plans as elders. We think, well, this would be a good series, and we should do this, we should do that. And that title struck me before we did this series that we should call the gifts of God for the whole church. Why? Because uh, typically, and you've heard it, that most of these series are titled the gifts of the whole church. Amen? End of story. And therefore, we need to have a spiritual gift assessment or a test. Good. I really want to encourage you to see this, that he really did. Because as I've alluded to already in prayer and in word, um, the triune God is involved in every single one of the gifts. Actually, the three categories of the gifts. You know, our tendency in our world today is to think that, well, yeah, Jesus did his thing, and yes, Jesus is building his church, but today, it's the Holy Spirit. Just the Holy Spirit. He's a big deal. He's incredibly important. But the reality is the Scripture, scripture teaches us that he is fully submissive to the Father and the Son. It's an amazing unified relationship. And so what we see is, is that the Holy Spirit has his own set of gifts that he gives to you and to I for the common good for the church. So does Jesus. We saw those in Ephesians 4, the gift of apostle and prophet and so on, right? But interestingly, today's gifts, the ones we're going to see and learn about today that we've already read about, these are the gifts that are given to the church from the Father. I want you to think about that. Because we're talking about miracles, healings, and tongues. It's not the Holy Spirit gifts. They're actually the gifts that are given to us by the Father. Now, important caveat and point is this. There are three categories of gifts and three givers of the gifts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is, however, important to note. It is the Holy Spirit of God who empowers them all in us today. Amen? That's important to see. So we see that in our first three verses, which I'm going to put on screen this morning from our text. And we've, we saw this before, we highlighted it before, but I'm hoping today it, it sinks in, it concludes for us. And it should give us a broader perspective of the workings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our own personal lives, but also in the lives of the church and the mission and the kingdom of God in this world today. That's my hope. I hope it's yours too. Paul wrote this. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. See that? And there are varieties of ministries or service, but the same Lord, that is Jesus. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. God, Theos, Father, in that verse. And so we've already seen this, but I'll highlight it again quickly, and that is this. The, the, the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the church, Rudy spoke about last week. Those are the gifts that are in Romans and in chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. And these are the ones that he specifically gives to the church. And of course, he empowers those as well. These are the charismata, the grace gifts that he gives to the church. And they're given directly to us by the Spirit who empowers them. And, and Rudy made this really good point last week. It's a great point. It's an important point. And he quoted it from Scripture and Paul's words in Romans that we should not think more highly of ourselves. We should humble ourselves when it comes to spiritual gifts. Amen? And he, of course, pointed out that Glenn should humble himself. 
I was sitting right at the back when he said that. Do you remember that? And of course, Rudy and all of us. But especially, listen, of course, those who are the public eye or the public gifts of the church, the more visible gifts of the church, must be careful about that and humble ourselves and not think that our gifts are more important. And so should you. You shouldn't think that either. And therefore, that your gifts are lesser. And so I also want to suggest this to you is also true. Since you are gifted by God, you can think highly enough of yourself. You should think highly enough of yourself. No matter what the gift is, that you can actually accomplish whatever his will is and you can utilize that gift powerfully, as powerfully as any other gift in the church because he's the one giving it to you and empowering you. I hope you get that encouragement today. And of course, there's the gifts that Christ gave that we saw, the service, the ministry gifts in Ephesians 4, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers. Jesus gives those leadership gifts to men and to women, to the church, for the building up of the church, and these are foundational leadership gifts. Really necessary in the church. Equally so with every other gift. And now today, these gifts are called the activities. Uh, The actual Greek word is energima, where we get the word energy. So it's kind of like the workings. You would think it's Holy Spirit. Oh, it is, because it's empowered by him. That it's power gifts, Holy Spirit. It is empowered by him. But these are gifts from God that are about the working, the energizing of the body of Christ, of the church, given to us from the Father. And they flow out from him, which, as I've already mentioned, is quite interesting because many of these gifts that we look at today, again, are, are usually, in most people's minds, ascribed to the, well, the evidence of the Holy Spirit, right? Miracles, and healings, and yes, tongues. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Paul goes on in verses 6 to 8 to tell us this. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. So Paul has already made this clear in the Ephesians 4 text, when Jesus gives his gifts to the church, that these gifts are given to everyone. Everyone in the church, in the body of Christ, has a gift. Everyone is a member of the body. Not just the the mouth, but the arms, the legs, the feet. And they're absolutely necessary for the functioning and for the health of a local church. Each is given this, and each is given spiritual gifts, plural. And here Paul also reminds us what he told us in Ephesians 4 through the gifts of Jesus, that these gifts are given not so much for you and I to feel better about ourselves or more important, although we should be encouraged by them. They are given for the common good. They're given to us for the sake of others. They're given to us so that we can bless one another and so that we can be a healthy family living in community together before we even think about going and making disciples of unbelieving people. We need to be expressing and using those gifts right here in the local church. So I want you to think about that for a second. We we commonly say this phrase at the Rock Church. It's a true phrase. I didn't make it up myself. I don't know where I heard it first, but it's this. God is good to everyone all the time. Think about it. It, It's a true statement. Sometimes you might think, well, coronavirus? Tragedies? Sickness? Death? Terrible disease? God is good to everyone all the time. He is. His plans and his, his will and his ways are way beyond our understanding. But he will work out everything to his will and for our good? Now, if that's true, and it is, how does he do that in this world today? Working through you. Working through me to bring his goodness and his love and his affection and his healing and his gifts and his power to your brothers and sisters. That's how he does it. It's not just some mystical manifestation. It's through others. Think about that this week as you reflect on how you've been blessed by others through each other. So next we read this. We read in this, this verse, these two verses, 
through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Now, it's interesting. These are the first of the gifts in this passage that the Father gives to us to, him, to, to gift us for the common good of the church and our brothers and sisters in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they're given as a pair. That's interesting, and we should take note of that. And, and the reason why they appear together is because most often they actually appear together in the same person. Right? So why would that be? Well, because it's related to a specific function that is necessary for the common good of those in the church, in the, the family of God, and that is right there in the text, the word utterance, <laughs> which is verbalizing, speaking, not just preaching, utterance, just speaking it out is given for the common good. And it, it comes from, in every single case, and this is important for us to see in many of the gifts, this utterance of knowledge and wisdom comes from one single source. The Word of God. It, it doesn't come from Glenn's good ideas or good advice. It doesn't come from yours either. right? It, it comes from here. This utterance of knowledge and wisdom. So the gift of knowledge literally is this. It's the, the ability to understand, organize, and speak the truth that is found in God's Word. Open your Bibles, please. Right? That's why I say it. It needs to happen every day. Not just for this gift to be actualized and realized in your life, which is for your good, by the way, let alone the good of others, so that you can understand it and then it, after a while, you start to go, wow, I, I see how these things fit together. It gets organized, right? And, 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 and then you, you, you actually find yourself speaking about it. Go figure. It's a remarkable thing. Think about anything else that you've studied and learned about. You have a coffee, you have whatever with a friend, and all of a sudden you're talking about that thing you've learned about. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, how we do that? We understand, we organize, and then we speak. The person gifted in this way, they, they love once they get into it, they, they love to dig deep. They start opening their Bibles and they can't get enough of it. They just love to dig deep into God's Word. And as a result of this diligent digging, they, under, they, they see light bulbs start going off for them. And they're going, I didn't realize that before. i got to tell somebody. It's, that's honestly how it happens. I know that's how it's happened for me. It, not just a long time ago, which it did, but, but even recently. Related to the title of our series, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These, these are light bulb moments that God gives to us when we dig into his word. Then what happens is the gift of wisdom steps up and applies those truths. You can't help it. You're, you're, still, you're digging diligent in the word of God. It's starting to make sense to you. You start to put the pieces together, Old Testament, New Testament, the, the, the story of God, you know, uh, who God is, what he has done, who we therefore are, and how then we should live. All of these wonderful arcs, right? And you start putting it together, and then it's like, oh, I know how this could help me. Oh, I know how this could help others. And you, you, you start to become what? Wise. <laughs> and that wisdom gets to be shared with others and people look at you and go, oh, you're so wise. No, they, they might. But more importantly, they might go, oh, thank you. That is so helpful. That is so helpful. So the person who has this gift of wisdom steps up and applies those truths to a specific circumstance or situation that those in the church, in their family, are experiencing. And it is incredibly helpful. Now, I've thought about some illustrations or examples of that. You've probably been in business, uh, uh, educational situations, uh, um, organization situations, or in the church situation where you've been there's been a big problem. There's an issue and everybody's struggling with it and nobody can really figure out how it's supposed to be dealt with. And then there's someone in that group and specifically in a church organization, which is awesome when this happens, uh, um, in a church um, eldership or meeting or a planning se session, whatever it might be, where someone is like, you know, I was reading Proverbs and, and, and or the Psalms or you know, the, the parable of Jesus about this and, 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 and you know, I just, I just realized that isn't that our answer? And everybody in the room kind of goes, amazing. 
That's those two gifts working together in such wonderful and important ways. Do we need that gift, those sets of gifts, that pair of gifts in the church today? Oh, yes. Pray for that gift. Pray that you would have that gift. From time to time, your brothers and sisters will need it. He goes on in verse 9 to say, To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. So a gift of faith is next. Um, It's important that we mustn't confuse this gift with the gift of faith that we are all given that leads us to repentance from our sins and faith in Christ alone for our salvation. That's That's the first step gift. It's a different gift. It's a gift that every one of you who currently knows Jesus Christ as your Savior and you really do know that and are born again, you've received that. Thankfully, receive that gift. If you haven't, you can. The good news is that there's nothing you can do to earn God's acceptance and approval and love. His love is unconditional, but the reality is he's done it all. Christ did it for you. You can trust that. So that's the first step of faith. This here is a gift of faith for the common good that looks like this. It's given to people who, uh, for example, might have an apostolic gift. You know, those dreamers, those visionaries who, who look out and they go, oh yeah, we could plant a church here, or we could start this ministry there, or we could do this, or we could do that, right? And they're like, they, they, they all of a sudden also have this gift of faith, which is really quite ridiculous. They have this innate ability to see the possibility to do great things, incredible things, despite the fact there's absolutely no way they, they have the resources or the capabilities to pull it off themselves, Right? They have this thing where they just want to see the kingdom of God expand and they're willing to step up knowing that one thing is true. The most important thing is true. God can and does do the im what? Possible. That's an incredible gift of faith that we all can pray for and have at any given time. So for the person with this gift, knowing that they see what they see is completely beyond their ability and resources. Here's what happens. It's weird. What happens with these people is once they realize that there's a great vision, it's a great idea, it's needed, and, and I need to somehow catalyze this and vision this and call people to it, they get really excited when they realize it can't be done. Okay, it's weird, isn't it? Without God. But it actually, it actually gets them excited. That's the gift of faith. And the reason why it's weird for most of us, the truth is, the reason why it's, is because well, we, we doubt ourselves every day, don't we? We doubt ourselves, we doubt others. We even doubt God. On and on and on, right? The good news is God knows that. And that's why he gives us these crazy people who have that gift of faith. So don't doubt them. Question them. Make sure they've got a few ducks in a row, but don't doubt them. Paul then goes on to gifts of healing. Now, I want you to hear that it's plural. Um, the, the, um, it should be gift of healings, but this translation translated gifts of healings, and it's, it's a plural. So the healings are plural, and that's an important designation. And from that, we understand this about the gift of healings for today. We understand that the gift of healing is about healing at every level. Physical healing, yes. But also healing from an emotional and spiritual end as well. So it's threefold. Physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual healing. When we read the Gospels and the books of Acts, we see the incidences of physical healings, and, and, and we look at that, and some people look at that and go, well, why not today? Well, we'll get to that. But they look at that, and the, the lame walk, right? The blind see, you know, fevers are cast out of people, right? And, of course, one of the most incredible uh, healings or miracles, it could be, it's both, is, of course, the resurrection from the dead that Jesus performed a couple of times, right? And that's pretty remarkable. That's healing, It is. What we need to understand is, and we should understand is this, at no time in the scripture, in the New Testament, do we ever read about an apostle or anyone else for that matter 
being described as someone who is a healer. Okay? That's important. The gift of healing was given to various people, including to Jesus, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to perform those healings and miracles at specific times, and then at other times, not so much. That's important that we understand that. It was given for specific situations, and then you don't see it for a bit. In the case of the most notable resurrection of his friend Lazarus, uh, Jesus' friend Lazarus, we should remember two things about that. I remember preaching on this at, at someone's funeral, which is Lazarus, raised from the dead, is always a good one, um, uh, for a funeral. Uh, but I remember making this point, it's true. You realize that Lazarus did eventually physically die. Like Jesus, Jesus didn't raise him from the dead and then he was alive forever. And that's because there's a second point related to that. And the point of his resurrection was to show us that we all must be, hear this, spiritually born again, spiritually resuscitated, raised from the dead spiritually before our death, if we are going to enjoy the resurrection unto eternal life. That's why that miracle happened, why that healing happened. So for today, let me encourage us by pointing out the obvious. First, there are charlatans. There are fake healers. It's a hashtag. Turn on your TV after midnight. There are charlatans. There are fake healers. We need to be wise. They exist. And the one thing that I, I want to encourage you is something that I actually had to get over sometimes in my, in my view of this is, you know, first of all, judging too harshly the, the faith healers because that's not my job. God will do a good enough job of that. I fear for them, quite frankly. I fear for them. But one thing we, we should never do is judge the people who are there, the thousands of people who come and give their money to these men. Be careful because the reality is the struggle is real. And there's a point in time going to come in all of our lives where we're going to want that kind of healing. Right? Now here's what is also obvious. This is also obvious. God does heal today. Sometimes quickly and oftentimes permanently. Now some of you might say, well, yeah, but don't see it that often. I'll... I'll speak about that in a second, but, or, yet yeah, we always hear about it over there in the mission field or over in these places, and, you know, there's miraculous healings, and, but why aren't we seeing it? And listen, it's the same as what we saw in the days of the apostles and Jesus. The reason why those are happening in those areas is because the gospel's being taken there for the first time. It's breaking out, and the miraculous is a sign as it was in the days of Jesus and the apostles, that the power of God is with those who are healing in those places. Now, of course, the question then becomes, if God can and does heal, why is that gift happening so infrequently in our world, in North America in particular? Why? Friends, in the life of this church, 10, 11 years, we've walked with three, maybe four, but three in particular that I can remember individuals who were stricken with cancer. and We laid hands on them, anointed with oil. We prayed. We believed in their possible healing. They died. They went to be with Jesus. That's critically important to understand. But they did eventually die. So why, God? Well, verse 11, the last verse of our passage today tells us why. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each individually, look at these words, as he wills. God is good to everyone all the time. The Holy Spirit in unity with the Father and the Son does not will, listen, that the physical gift of healing occur as often today as it did in the days of the early, early church. That's his will. He knows what he's doing. His will is good. And he knows what he's doing. On the other hand, and this is something we may not see, but 
I see it. Many of you have seen it. The gift of healing occur, occurs frequently in the area of emotional, mental, and on the spiritual level. Along, along with possibly the gifts of knowledge and wisdom, there are many people, some in our church, who are studying biblical counseling, studying it well and deeply. Why? So they can minister to people who are struggling emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And do you know what? We see healing. We see complete healing. I, I worked for three and a half years full-time and then for another 15 years as a, a, quote, consultant to Union Gospel Mission in downtown Vancouver. You know what? God heals people of alcoholism, drug addiction, every other kind of addiction. He heals. And you know what? He uses gifted men and women to bring that healing to people. To bring that healing to people. And so that's an important way to see that. Um, there's other ways that we could see that in our world today, but we'll go on because we'll come back to that in a bit. In verse 10, he lays out the last of the five gifts that we'll look at this morning. Like, and, and it's these, these words. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So like physical healing, we see literally far less of the miraculous today than we did in the days of the early church. Uh, at, at the time of the early church, and again, any study of theology and doctrine and, and the New Testament will tell us this, that miracles were, were given by God in, in a greater quantity to demonstrate the power of God breaking out in this world today, in that day, through whom? Through Jesus Christ. God in the flesh comes to do that. And, and, and essentially is saying to the, the world at that time and to us today, this is the way it's going to be. I'm showing you today that one day there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. There will no, be no more death. This is breaking in at that time, the power of God. So nature itself was shown to be subject to Jesus and the power of God. And so the question is, is it possible for that gift to be displayed today? I said this at the very beginning of our series related to all of the gifts. He's God He's sovereign, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If he chooses to use one of these gifts today, perform one of these miracles or healings today, if it's his will, he will. We must believe that. We absolutely must believe that. But again, as the scripture teaches, as he wills. And it does appear today to be less. But again, but why? Why less today of the miraculous? Lord, why? Well, again, the testimony of Scripture tells us that both the gifts of physical healing and miracles were given for the initial building up of faith as a way for Christians to move beyond, beyond just seeing to believe and having faith in God even when they can't see what He's doing. That's where we're at today. In fact, if you diligently study the book of Acts and the epistles, which I have, and I know many of you have, you will note a steady, a steady decline in the miraculous. It's just, it just goes on. I mean, in the second letter of Timothy, t uh, Paul's writing to his young protege, Timothy, and, and Timothy's obviously written a letter to him and said, I've got a stomachache. You know, it's worse than a stomachache because he's writing about it and it's a real problem. And so what does Paul say to him? Oh, call the elders and have them lay hands on you and heal you? No. He says, have some Merlot. A little wine for your tummy's sake. Paul had the gift of healing at certain times, but he gives that advice. I love these words of Ray Steadman. I'll put them on screen for you. I quoted Ray when we went through our Body Life series, and he writes some great stuff in, in Body Life about spiritual gifts and stuff, but he, he says this on this point, and I love it. Look at this. He says, God wants us to walk by faith today, not by sight. As faith grows, we have less need of physical, visible demonstrations of God's power. He wants us to become mature enough that, the, look at this, the battery of our faith no longer needs to be repeatedly jump-started by miracles. Friends, I, I see that quite often. I don't mean to be critical, but I see quite often people, okay, they, 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 they work on the Christian life, they read their Bibles, they go to small groups, they start discipling people, they start serving, and then, then some kind of problem shows up in their lives, and it's like... I need a jump start. I, I, I need a whoosh. I need... Steady as she goes. 
steady as she goes. God knows what he's doing. He truly knows what he's doing. So once again, we see in this passage here the gift of prophecy. Now, we've covered it. It's interesting. This is the point I want to make about it for you today, is that the gift of prophecy, we've been talking about it every, every week. Because in all three of the categories of the scriptures we've looked at, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, here today, prophecy, prophecy. The whole chapter 14 of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is the comparison between prophecy, and we're going to get to it, tongues. Let me, let me do that again. Prophecy, tongues. And so let me make this point. Rudy also spoke about this gift last week a little bit because it's part of that text, as I said, Today, let me make this emphatic point then on this gift. Paul opens chapter 14 saying these words, pursue love because of the love chapter in 13, right? Comparing all the gifts and saying, listen, the gifts are wonderful, but listen, without love, they're nothing. Exactly. But he starts with these words, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So the point is, please hear me today, prophecy is the greatest of all the gifts available to us today. That's the point. That's what we need to be looking for individually, but also corporately in the body is that gift to be alive and well today. So then we have next the ability to distinguish between spirits. Do you see that? This gift is so needed in the church today, but as I was thinking about it, it came to my, my mind, I want to suggest to you it may be the least liked gift in the church today. Do you want to know why? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> why I think it's the least liked gift in the church today. The person who is gifted this way oftentimes is accused outside the church for sure, but even inside the church of being one word. What? Judgmental. The person who has this gift has a nose. Okay? And, and they have the ability. It's like a sniff test. Someone can be preaching a sermon or giving a talk on, on the Bible or God or some doctrine for like three, four, five minutes, or they can be reading the first couple of chapters of a person's book, even the prologue, and go, okay, something's off here. Do you really like the person who has a gift like that? Do, do you ever question a person who has a gift like that? Well, I don't know. Like, you're being quite judgmental. Like, I mean, do you, like, these are Christian brothers and sisters you're talking about here. Hey, um... This is a gift. This is a gift. And it's a gift where people actually have and quickly can come to discern truth from error. Do not despise this gift. It's an important gift. But if you have that gift, be careful. Be careful before you articulate. Would you pray for a moment? It might be helpful. Trust me. But it's a very important and necessary gift in the church today. A good illustration of that be, you all remember chapter 5 of Acts, right? Just before that, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Joseph, uh, uh, a bunch of money to the apostles from a property that he'd sold. Well, there was a couple in the church, Ananias and Sapphira, remember those guys, right? And they figured, well, boy, everybody loves uh, good old Barnabas for doing that. Here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll sell a piece of property, but we'll keep some of the money from ourselves. You know, like we'll tie the, to ourselves, okay? And then we'll take the rest to the apostles, put it before their feet, and we'll stand up in front of everybody and, and look really good. Peter's got the nose. And he goes, what are you doing? Without them telling anything, he goes, why? And listen, these are the important words in Acts chapter 5. Look it up for yourself. He says, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? It's the gift of discernment. It's an incredibly important gift. Finally, arrive at the gift of tongues. And the interpretation of tongues. Um, there's some things I need to say about this that are encouraging some of you, and some of you might be going, hang on. These gifts are listed last. Do you notice that? sets we've seen so far, this is the only time they're mentioned. They're, they're mentioned last in the gifts by the Apostle Paul. So we should not spend too much time on these gifts today because of the importance that's placed on them in Scripture, but also because I want to suggest to you in some places in the world today, in certain churches and denominations, there's far too much attention placed on these. Amen? Again, let's not judge because we have brothers and sisters, friends who, this is a big deal, and so I want to be careful. 
are these gifts for today? I want to give you an answer, and my answer is going to be possibly. Am I walking a, a fence here? No. Possibly means most likely. He's God. He's sovereign. If the gift of tongues is needed and necessary, he will give this gift. The question is, what are they, and how, according to the Scripture, should we expect them to manifest? A few facts. A couple of really important facts, not to dissuade you or alter, encourage you. Uh, they appear only five times in the book of Acts. Five times. They appear in the New Testament 25 times. Now, here's what's very interesting. Um, of the 20 times, uh, of the 25 times that they appear in the New Testament, 20 times they appear in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. You don't have to be a student or a, a, an attender listening to sermons for too long in the Christian church to know that the, the letter to the Corinthian church was written primarily, not exclusively, but primarily as a what? A corrective letter. This was an on-fire church. They were actually quite wealthy, successful, growing, big, gospel-oriented, yes, but the gifts? Oh, that was awesome. And some things were getting out of control. And Paul had to write to them because what was happening is they were majoring in the minors. And it was actually keeping them from the gifts that they should be seeking that would be more profitable for the common good and for the church. So tongues are clearly one gift that Paul felt the need to give some correction on. So first, what we find in the New Testament uh, from Acts in particular is this. And it's important. In Acts, in every single case, the gift of tongues is a known language. And so those who were gifted with this, this gift were people who previously did not know Korean or whatever language it might be, but were now seen to be speaking in perfect, fluent Korean by Koreans. That's a miracle, let alone a gift. But that's what the gift was in those days, speaking fluently. Secondly, whenever always, always read the scripture, to the praise and glory of God. Speaking in tongues, day of Pentecost, read it, they were praising God, praising of the tongue, the language people from nations were hearing in their own tongue, the people of God praising God. That's an important distinction. Paul confirms that in 1 Corinthians 14, 2. He says, for one, and they're praising God, or the glory of God, I should say, for one who speaks in the tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Now, that language literally means it's not like the, the tongue is speaking about you men or to the praise or to the encouragement of you men, but to God. That's what that language actually means. Tongues were never used as a form of new revelation or proclamation. Anywhere in the scripture. Thirdly, the gifts of tongues was and isn't, is intended as a side to unbelievers and not believers. Paul again made that clear. I'll put it on scripture for, on screen part of you for, for you. First Corinthians 14, he said this, and he's quoting Isaiah. This is amazing. It's a prophecy, a prophecy from like several hundred years ago, and, and Isaiah's prophesying to the days of the New Testament, and he says this, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, foreign languages, I will speak to this people, and even then, will not listen to me, says the Lord. He's speaking about the people of Israel on the day of Pentecost who wouldn't hear this. And then Paul adds, thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but believers. Fourth, in every instance we see the gift in the New Testament, it is public, not private. It's always public. It's not a private gift when you see it explained in the New Testament or evident in the New Testament. Now, one thing that I need to highlight for you that has created a lot of confusion in the church in the past 50, 60 years in particular is a translation which I happen to love. It's a great translation. It's called the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, it's a wonderful translation, but it's unfortunate that in 1 Corinthians 14, they consistently translated the word for tongues as unknown tongue. Now, you combine that with the hyperbolic words that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 13, where he says, if I speak in the tongue, uh, tongues of men, and hear this, angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So some would suggest that when you put those two ideas together, unknown tongue and, oh, 
there's tongues of men's and angels, that there is now apparently a heavenly angelic language. This is hyperbole. You can tell by the use of the word if. Paul's trying to pose a, a, a position once against the other just to make an important point. He even goes on to say this, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. It's, it's, a, it's a whole section on this comparison and this hyperbole. And here's the point that I would make and where I think we need to be careful is this. Many people will say, well, this is a heavenly language and it's a prayer language and, and, and that's a, a tongue that has been given and I have it. And, I'm, and I would say, well, be, be careful. Go to the Lord about that, for sure. But also, if that's the case, then we should also be praying for the faith to move mountains. Don't see much of that today. Right? So it's hyperbole in that passage. Now, we're going to get to the completion of this part here before I conclude. And before those of you who honestly believe that you have the gift of tongues for today in, in a prayer language or whatever it might be, let me just suggest this to you. Search the Word of God. Search the Word of God. And, and if you honestly believe in your heart it is His will for you to have this gift and to be able to pray in this way, then pray in tongues. You'll see more about that in just a second, which is why I suggest that should be okay. I want to give you one reason why you should be aware of tongues and one reason why you shouldn't be, be, aware of, be afraid of tongues. The reason why we should all be aware of tongues is this. If you think of all the gifts, they are probably the And many have been pregnant in the tongues. Now, I, I know of many charismatic churches that are awesome. I know that there are churches where if you want to be baptized as a believer and become a member of the church, you must speak in tongues. If you want to be in full-time ministry in those churches, you must demonstrate that you can speak in tongues. The testimony of not just a few, but of many people is that they felt pressure and that they faked it. That's not what this is about. So we need to be aware of that and be careful about that. Never be pressured into it. But the second thing is this. The reason why we should not be very is from Scripture. Paul completes his teaching on gifts, 1 Corinthians 14, with these words. So, my brothers and sisters, earnestly desire to prophecy. Remember that? It's up here, right? And then he says, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Don't forbid it. But he again shows us that positioning. All things should be done decently and in order. So how do I wrap this up for you? Because the question has to be, most of us have to be sitting here going, I know I would be. How in the world do I know what my spiritual gifts are? Some of you might have heard gift tests. I recommend that. Go ahead. Go ahead. But it's simple. It sounds like it'd be the easy way. But actually, again, if you've seen it working out in people's lives, you look at the scripture. Let me give you six points. Number one, to discover what your gift is, pray. Immerse yourself in God's Word. Go looking for it. And in prayer to God, what is my gift? What, can, what, what, what do you want to empower me with, give to me, so I can bless my church family? Pray that. Secondly, submit yourself to Jesus Christ, to the head of the church, the head of the body, and to His will for your life. Thirdly, study the passages where the gifts are listed and Start trying one out. Just go for it. What could happen? You'll find that it's not your gift. You'll find out that you can't really golf. We try things. Try it out. Thir fourthly, seek the encouragement and the affirmation of your church family. And listen, church family, encourage people in their gifts. It's been great to see that in our community groups where people have been doing that. Fifth, and this is a big one for some of you. <laughs> Be a committed member of your local church family. Stay put. Show up. Serve. Can't do it when it's infrequent. It just, it, just won't, it just won't happen for you or for us. Number six, remain humble and confident at the same time. 
Paul concludes, or a little later in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the, the, the people who will go, well, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just a foot. I'm not really needed. Oh, yes, you are. And, and then also the, the arrogant and proud who goes, well, I'm, I'm on the stage. You know? Who really needs the hand or the elbow? Well, settle down, preacher. Let me give you a couple of quick illustrations. We were in small group this past week, and I was trying to think about an illustration. And my dad was a, a custom home builder and a contractor, and a fellow who was there uh, at our small group was there, and it just came to me. And I said, I mean, think about it this way: if you if you were to build a custom home here somewhere in Squamish, you know they're being done. I mean, what would you need? What would happen if on the first day there's dirt, right? And and the only people who show up on the first day of that build are the framers, right? Well, people would be going, well, <laughs> yeah, okay, great to have you guys here, but uh, we can't, we're not ready for you. Right? Uh, we need a foundation. We need, and be, it, then we need plumbing and, and we need drainage. And, 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 and so when you think about it, in building a beautiful custom home, that will, a house, pardon me, that will one day become a home, what do you need? You need gifted professionals. Okay, you just need gifted people. Let's be careful here because I don't want you to think you have to be a professional. But you need trades. You need, you need sparkies. You need electricians. You need plumbers. You, know? you need framers. You need... You need roofers, you need finishers, carpenters, you need all these different people. And when they all show up and, and, and they all bring their gifts and their talents and the abilities of one day, you stand back outside and you hand the keys to the people who are going to make it a home and you look at it and you go, that's an awesome house. It's really well built. And you know what? We all had a part in it. Some of you are going to recognize this picture. That's from our first trip to Mexico, to the Baja, four or five years ago, I think it was. And uh, when we arrived on the first day at the, uh, the build site uh, to build a two-room two school for kids, that's what was there. So the apostles and the prophets had showed up, right, and they laid the foundation, right, because that was necessary. And so you show up for a, a five day, five days, in four days of building, we're going to build a two-room school. Really? How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happens. You know, 25 to 28 of us went down there, and as we arrived on that site that day, and, and Tom started pulling out the trucks and all the tools and all the rest of it, people started going, okay, I'll know what I'll do. Uh, give me some paintbrushes and paint, and I'll go start painting. And so a bunch of women, mostly, but some others too, you know, went over and started painting, like pre-painting the, the panels that were going to go up, right? And then there were, of course, a couple of dudes who were going, I'm a framer. I do the walls, right? And they just stepped in and started doing the framing, right? And then it just keeps going where, oh, there's roofers, and, and hey, you notice that I think uh, Wayne looks like a supervisor to me. I don't know. <laughs> he worked really hard. But, you know, so people start doing that. And, and Janice, my, my wife, like and some of the women are up on the roof and nailing, you know, like Lorraine up there on the roof nailing. And so you go from at one point doing one job and then you go doing another and you just, it just keeps going. And then finally, we have a two-room schoolhouse in four days. Why? How? Friends, let me, two things right before I close. Why we encourage short-term missions is because this is where you learn what we're talking about here today. You learn to use gift, talent, and build. You didn't know you were a painter, did you? You didn't know you could nail a hammer, use a hammer and a nail properly, did you? Some of you can't, so don't do it. Um, or a chop saw or whatever it might be, right? But you did it. You showed up, and we accomplished something wonderful. But it's also because of this. We, we, want, we want you to understand what the body is supposed to look like, what the church is supposed to look like. Parents, I want to really encourage you, as your kids get to a certain age, when they're old enough to be able to contribute in this work, it costs $1,200 to go on this trip, approximately, I think, right, guys? You're going to spend in five years putting your kids into soccer, skiing, whatever it might be, a lot more than that. Take them on a missions trip and show them what it looks like to be part of the body of Christ where we all contribute. And you know what we also do? We bless a school. We bless a people who really need to be blessed. So friends, I want to close with this question. Do you believe in your heart of hearts that a church the size of the rock, 120 to 140 adults plus kids when we're all out, can make a difference in Squamish? and to the ends of the earth? Do you believe that? Well, I want you to remember something. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on 
those men and women there, there were 120 of them. And he empowered those men and women to, to start a church. And on that day, the day of Pentecost, after Peter's sermon, the gospel was preached, 5,000 people came to Christ. They were all empowered. They were all filled. And the church has been expanding through spirit-filled, spirit-gifted, and spirit-empowered men and women to this day. The answer to the question is, oh, yes, he can, church. Pray with me, would you? Father.